Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. And I'm Tracy McRae. New parents will do everything they can do to protect their child, from car seats to safe sleep, to making sure that only clean hands touch their child. <laughs> but have we taken cleanliness too far? Too far indeed. The hygiene hypothesis suggests that children who have more exposure to germs and certain infections at a very early age develop immune systems that are better suited to differentiating harmless substances from harmful substances. In this theory, exposure to certain germs teaches the immune system not to overreact. So here's what we need to know, dad of a lot of babies over there. <laughs> Just how clean does your baby need to be? Here to discuss this is Mayo Clinic pediatrician and the star of Mayo Facebook Live's <laughs> Ask Mayo Mum segments, Dr. Angela Matke. Welcome to the program, Dr. Matke. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> so the uh, hygiene hypothesis, is it bunk or it, I, I sign on to it because it worked for me, but what do you say? I think a lot of the evidence and the science over the, the last 10 to 20 years really does point to we need to have frequent exposures to microbes in our environment. So microbes are any viruses, bacteria um, that would be in your environment that you come in contact with. And what we call the things that they actually come in contact with are antigens. And children and all of us need lots of exposures of these so our immune system knows how to respond to when something harmful comes in and not overreact to something that's going to be innocuous like pet dander mm -hmm. or something like that. And is that why people end up developing allergies? Is that one of the theories? It's one of the theories. I mean, there's a lot of factors we think that go into it. And there's not one thing that you can point to for a reason why someone develops allergies or asthma. Um, but it certainly um, has been shown in studies that for children that have early exposure, so maybe children that live on the farms, um, have multiple siblings at home, they are at lower risk for the development of asthma, um, sometimes for allergies and uh, for food allergies and eczema as well. So this makes complete sense now. My my aunts were always right. Growing up as a child, would go to holiday to India, mm -hmm. and my sister and I would always get sick, and my cousins would never be sick. <laughs> right. So clearly they had early exposure to these antigens. Right. So every day uh, we, we bath our kids. Should we be doing that every single day? No, you don't have to. You could actually cut down on your, on your daily routine with the kids a little bit. Um, it's starting with infants. Um, they don't need to be bathed daily. So a couple times a week is really all that infants need. It's pretty simple. Just look at your children. If they look physically dirty, that's a good time to bathe them, okay? You can <laughs> if just, they smell physically right. dirty, if they smell. also. <laughs> but if it's part of your routine, and if it's part of something that works really well with your family, helps kids unwind, there's not a reason why you can't do it daily. Um, but if you're going to do it, you just want to make sure that you're doing a good moisturizer afterwards. There's a difference, though, between uh, you don't have to worry about bathing them daily and what my family would say is you got to let them eat dirt. I mean, <laughs> right, this right. is a big range we're talking about here. Right. So what about when they're when they always have their hands in their mouth? So when they always have their hands in their mouth before they are going to be ingesting things or doing eating meals, it's a good idea to have them wash their hands. It's just teaching them good um, hand hygiene, which is going to translate for when they're sick too. So if they know how to wash their hands before regular meals, they will be better at, at being compliant about washing their hands when they're sick. And using good hand hygiene when you're sick is going to help prevent um, infections for other people um, and hopefully help them um, heal better. So if we talk about the, the way to clean your hands, mm -hmm. should we be using soap and water or should we be using the hand sanitizers? Great question. So the CDC has good guidelines on this. So generally, soap and water is best. Um, and hand sanitizer should only be really used if you don't have access to soap and water. Um, hand sanitizer, if you're going to use it, you want to make sure it has at least 60% alcohol content or higher. Um, but hand sanitizer isn't... Um, isn't going to get rid of all your germs and all your microbes in the same way with hand washing. Hand washing will only get rid of it as much as how thorough you are at your hand washing. There are certain infections that hand sanitizer won't be covered with, and I actually just learned at a conference that norovirus is one of those. Mm -hmm. So norovirus is the one you hear about with outbreaks on cruise ships. It causes that gastroenteritis that's pretty prolonged, miserable, lots of vomiting and diarrhea. And that's when you actually need to use hand um, soap and water and that physical contact of actually washing your hands is is the, what's going to be the most important in getting that, that virus off your hands. The uh, antibacterial this or that mm -hmm. uh, always I'm starting to give that a little bit of a suspicion because we're hearing about the overuse of antibiotics yeah. 
Is there a bridge in between those two things? Yeah, there is a bridge between like overuse of, of antibacterial soaps and there's specific components in act antibacterial soaps that we've been able to link, well, I shouldn't say we, but the science mm -hmm. community has been able to link actually increasing um, antibiotic resistance by different mechanisms depending on the type of microbe that you're looking at. Um, we also see that overuse of prescribing of antibiotics, so inappropriate use of antibiotic prescriptions has also been linked to um, increased infections and also leading to antibiotic resistant bugs. Um, and those antibiotic resistant bugs do have a huge impact on our health and of our society. So we're seeing millions of, of infections related to antibiotic resistant bugs each year. And the CDC quotes about 23,000 deaths per year related to antibiotic resistance. So we'll, as providers, um, we really need to, to practice what we call antibiotic stewardship, making sure that we are appropriately prescribing antibiotics. Um, when I, mo the most common thing I see kids in the, in the office for when they're sick is for colds, viruses, runny nose, and cough. And, and the CDC says about 50% of the time antibiotics are prescribed inappropriately because those are viruses. They won't be treated by an antibiotic. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're appropriately prescribing those and so that we can be part of helping decrease antibiotic resistance. Um, and then I also would make another pitch for hand washing. Hand washing in those situations um, when you're sick could actually reduce other people's getting sick um, by a good percentage. They, they quote about 30%. So it's important that you're sick to practice that good hand wash. And that's why you can teach kids how to use it now. But it's also really important not to, to teach your kids to be scared of all germs um, <laughs> because there's, it, it's, um, it's important for them to, to not have like a phobia develop early on by maybe your own fears of germs. Um, we, do, we do see that maternal anxiety or maternal anxious features can increase behavioral problems in kids and can also lead to mental health problems in, in later childhood and adulthood. So don't be a helicopter parent running around your child with a bottle of hand sanitizer. Um, let them, you know, explore their environment. And let them eat dirt, as, as the new book coming out <laughs> I, I says. could see everybody yeah. be feeding their kids dirt. <laughs> so we, we talked about hand washing, but a frequent thing in our household is when the pacifier drops on the floor. Yes. And uh, even and we were on a plane recently, and it dropped on the pl on the floor of the plane. And I was like, what do I do here? Should I wash it, or should I give it to and them? Right. How different is it from the first one to the second and third one? How's the, how oh, different? We're, we're much more relaxed with, with, <laughs> with our twins. It, absolutely. Anecdotally, it's, it's incredible as a parent to watch how you change. Oh, it's amazing. I, there's a great commercial that, that, that on, for mm -hmm. loves that talks about the first child versus subsequent children. <laughs> but yeah, back to pa hand sand or uh, pacifiers. Um, I think just use common sense. If you're at home in a relatively clean environment, if it's been on the floor for a couple seconds, it's not going to, to, to be seriously harmful to their health <laughs> to put it back in. It might actually be helpful. You're exposing them to different microbes. You're allowing their immune system to practice um, responding and recognizing other things and deciding if it's something that's serious that they need to respond to or something that's not as serious and that they don't need to set off the whole immune system response. And I have to tell you, Dr. Kakar, you've got toddlers right now. You have to wait until you've got an 11-year-old boy like me who will... <laughs> eat anything that is dropped anywhere no matter what is on it and if you're lucky you can get him to blow off or wipe off whatever is stuck to the candy he dropped out of his mouth and then puts back in so i just figure it's his benefit that he's been eating dirt all these years it's true. that keeps him it's safe true. it's probably it's probably building up his immune system you know it's giving him all these little opportunities to practice I um, shudder to think what he has eaten, but that's uh, another yeah. problem for I thought you were going to say he's still using the pacifier at 11. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's good. He's very good. And the five-second rule, when it comes to kids, everything is a five-second rule. Probably. I mean, if you're in a dirty environment, I wouldn't put your kid's pacifier back in. If you're in the hospital, I shudder to think what kind of microbes live in the hospital setting or out in a you know public place. But if you're at home in some place relatively clean, I think it's certainly fine to put back in their mouth. Um, it's a little bit controversial about whether you should put it in your mouth to clean it first. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys have heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there was one study that came out that showed it decreased the risk of, of eczema and asthma. It was a pretty small study, though. Um, the American uh, Dental Association shuddered when that publicity came out because it was picked up by a lot of media um, because their concern is that you're sharing microbes within your mouth and that can increase the risk of dental caries because there's certain types of bacteria mm -hmm. um, that, that we see if certain family members have it, the risk of that their children, if they get that, will also increase their dental caries. So if you have bad oral hygiene, a lot of dental caries, I wouldn't I wouldn't put the pacifier <laughs> back in your mouth. We've been talking about building up immunities in children with pediatrician Dr. Angela Matke. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Matke. Thanks for having me. And that's our program for this week.